We are continuing in the Gospel of Mark. If you haven't been with us, we've been walking through kind of systematically the Gospel of Mark, which we're calling the Gospel for Christians. The reason we call it that is because there's not a lot of content about what Jesus actually teaches in this Gospel. Although what we're talking about today and last week is probably the closest you're going to get uh, to maybe some content that Jesus teaches. It's a pretty important part of the Gospel of Mark, um, and we're, that's why we're spending a couple weeks in it. We've already had the Reverend uh, Jill Versteg preach on this passage as well. So we've got three times in this text as you, as, uh, after today, so it's a pretty important one. But last week we talked about, uh, that, about how Jesus had a secret. I know it's, always, it's, it's just fun to say that. I feel like I'm on a gossip train somewhere. I probably shouldn't be proud of that, but Jesus had a secret. He told his disciples what it was, and uh, I don't think they were really signing up for it right away. And we'll find that out in the Gospel of Mark as we go through. It's, it, the, the, the actual teaching, you know, what I say is like there's not much content. This is the closest you're going to get. Even the purpose of the parable is more of a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the next few chapters, which is all the people that are supposed to be doing the right things and doing the way that Jesus wants to do things are not going to be doing those things. And all the people that are supposed to not be doing those things are going to be the people that are doing these things, which we've already heard already. But that's kind of the setup of this. But we talked about Jesus' secret, which is about the kind of Messiah that he is and the kind of king that he's bringing. And we'll talk about that more again as we go throughout, just as a reminder today. But that was his secret. So today I'm going to flip the coin and talk about Satan's secret, which is really not a secret, but it's, a, it's something he wants to keep a secret. That also has to do with the text, because Jesus mentions Satan in this text. So let's read that again, Mark chapter 4. We're going to read verses 4, uh, sorry, 1 to 20 today, again, uh, with this text. I'll be reading out of the NIV of this parable. Mark chapter 4, 1 to 20. If you don't have your Bibles with you, we also have it on the screen as well. Mark says, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake, and the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. And while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went on to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil and sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. So other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And when he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. There's that secret. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that... They may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven, which we talked about last week. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seeds sown on rocky places hear the word at once, receive it with joy. But since they have no root... They last only a short time, and when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So others, like seeds sowing among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Let's pray together. God, I ask in this brief time that... My words would be your words, Lord, that you open our minds and hearts to what you have to say to us today, both individually and collectively. God, I pray that we would be able to discern and recognize the ways that Satan works. God, that we would not be led astray uh, by trivial matters. God, that we would understand uh, what your secret is versus Satan's and what we can do to continue to live this good news seven days a week. In the name of Jesus, everybody said Amen. I feel like today is one of these days that someone might call me a heretic, which is always welcome uh, if you want to try that. Uh, but talking about Satan is always an interesting thing. Well, I remember early in my Christian journey, uh, I hear this rhetoric a lot. Uh, if I was doing something I shouldn't do, or uh, maybe anything that ha- you know bad happened to me of some sort, usually someone would say something like. Um, 
you know, Satan was really working on me there, or Satan was really doing something, or Satan did this, or Satan did that. And sometimes people would even take it so far as like, you know, if something bad happened or whatever, they kind of like, well, well, you know, well, the devil made me do it. Now, they may not say it like that, but that's basically what they implied. Like, Satan has this direct, like, influence on what I do. And I couldn't tell you how absolutely horribly wrong that is about Satan. Uh, it's, it's giving him a little too much credit, actually. Um, but this, this type of thought goes around. I, I still people hear people say it today. Satan did this, Satan did that. So we're going to talk about Satan a little bit today uh, and how he works. And for some of you, this might be totally foreign to you. Uh, I, don't say this, I don't say this just on my own opinion, obviously. I say this from, uh, from, from Scripture as well, which I'm going to walk you through some of that today. Uh, and why that influences what Jesus is saying, and why does he actually say, mention Satan in this story? And what is Satan's secret, which is the title of the teaching, obviously. You've got to know the, what's the secret that he has. I mean, Jesus had a secret, which really wasn't a secret, Nobody, but the secret being no one really wanted to do it. That's why he kind of called it a secret, because it's like it's very subversive. It's definitely upside down. It's definitely not the way that people thought he should be as the Messiah or the kind of kingdom that he's bringing. Now, I want to be clear about this as we talk about Satan, because uh, some people might take this the wrong way. When we talk about like demon possession, for example, now in America, it's, it's something that is not as discussed uh, as now, but you know, if I go to uh, someplace outside of the United States of America, like for example, if I talk to our friends uh, at Ebenezer Discipleship Training Center in Haiti, I mean, there's very real stories of people who are literally possessed by demons. Like, there's no, there's no doubt that this kind of thing happens. That's not the same as Satan doing something to you. Some people like to attribute it that way, but that's not the same thing. Demon possession's real. In fact, we know it's real because Jesus is doing that all throughout the Gospel of Mark so far. He's been casting out demons left and right, right? To show his command over the spiritual realm, and especially of demons. And all the demons know who he is. They're always like, we know who you are. They try to name him who he really is to try to take power over him. That's what you do when you name something. You, you try to take try to claim power over it. That's what the demons are trying to do, and they know who Jesus is. But Jesus has that power, so it's, it's real. But I also want to caution us about how Satan gets involved in things, and it's, a, it's actually a lot more dangerous than what people usually say when Satan is trying to influence me individually. And I think a lot of our view, it's been shaped by films and books and all sorts of things. I mean, that's usually how it works, right? We see Satan in all sorts of things and, you know, even cartoons, you know, of how he's depicted but I think it's a lot more dangerous of how uh, Satan actually works uh, in Scripture. The closest we can get probably to any type of individual influence by Satan is way back in Genesis chapter 3 as the serpent, like when he's talking with the first humans. I think that's like the closest you can get. But even then, Satan is not talking about really an individual decision, although it is an individual decision that he's trying to influence but the scope and the magnitude of what he's trying to do is much different. And so before you think I'm going all crazy or I'm some heretic, let me set a couple of things straight. Number one, Satan's very real. That's, I'm not going to say Satan is fake, okay? He's very real. He's definitely very active. I don't want you to hear me wrong this morning. But the second thing is really important. This is what might be different for you about how Satan works. Satan works more at the macro level than the micro level. You know what I mean by that when I say macro and micro? So macro being like big, bigger than you, right? Systems, right? Structures, cosmic powers. That's where Satan works is the macro level, not the micro level, not the individual. You may even think there is individual times, but that's always at a macro level. For example, Job chapter 1, which is a really weird story to start the book of, the, the book of Job, like Satan walks up to God and says, hey, you know, you considered your servant Job, he's like a righteous person, he's like living the, living the flourishing life. I bet you if you let me have a crack at him, he'll curse you to your face. Like, yeah, he's talking about an individual, but the influence of what Satan does to Job is much more macro than just Job. It's mitigating like entire systems and circumstances that are just way beyond an individual. If you look at Zechariah chapter 3, we see Satan show up in the dream of a prophet along with the angel of the Lord. 
um, and Satan's accusing the high priest uh, in the vision of leading people astray in general. Not just, in, I'm, he's just talking about a system of leading people astray. Now, it looks like Satan's addressing an individual, but this is in a vision in a dream. This is when he shows up. But he's working on like a macro level of events, even in that. The Apostle Paul even sends, uh, spends considerable time talking about this. Now, he's not going to say Satan, but he has other words, other phrases to use in lieu of Satan. For example, Ephesians chapter 2. Actually, I've, I have this on the screen. Let me read this for you. Uh, As for you, this is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's his phrase for Satan. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. You see what he's doing here? He's not talking about an individual. He's talking about a whole slew of people and the whole idea of being disobedient to God, influencing any pattern, any structure that enforces a system of disobedience. That's macro. Does that make sense? That's not micro. This is not, Satan doesn't go possess an individual and show up, you know, as Satan. That's not what happens. He doesn't operate at that level. Now, demons do. His little minions. Yeah, demons do that. There's demon possession. That's very real. But that's not what Satan does. Not, there's actually even archangels. You've heard of archangels like Michael or Gabriel, right? Well, there's archangels that are also over entire nations. We hear about that in Daniel. In fact, that's why one of the archangels was late coming to Daniel in a vision. He's like, I, was, I spent the last three weeks fighting the prince of Persia. Like, who's the prince of Persia? The archangel that's in charge of Persia. Well, God had, God had char- in charge archangels over entire nations to influence systems and patterns of thought. So even archangels are like macro people. Satan is the master macro person, if that makes sense. Paul, sa- Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 4, he, he addresses Satan as the god of this age. Like Satan has power in this particular realm of the planet Earth that we live on. He has power here. And it's very much at a macro level. A lot of what Satan doing is, is influencing systems in which humanity is following patterns that are destructive. Because Satan's interest is only for you for all of us to be destroyed. That's his desire. He's like a, I mean, I might get attacked by all sorts of minions for saying this out loud, but I mean, he's just a whiny little dude, but he's really powerful. But he's, he's whiny about his, uh, his destiny. He knows what's happening. And he's going to do it, he's going to take a, as many of us down as he can with him. That's what Satan likes to do, but he does that as a macro level. He doesn't do that individually. He does that with systems and patterns of behavior. So what's his secret? Talking about Satan's secret, what is that? We talked about Jesus' secret, about the kind of Messiah that he is, because, again, everyone thought military conqueror, person who should be served because he's the king, he's going to overthrow Rome, all this stuff, right? And Jesus, later in the Gospel of Mark, he said, he says, he says to James and John, who are actually talking about a conversation, who's going to be more important, which is really funny, because you can tell, that's when you really know as a disciple you don't get it right now. But Jesus is like, yeah, I didn't come here to be served, guys. I came here to serve and to give my life, not to have people serve me and bow, and bow to me in that way to, for me to lord it over him. That's not what I came to do. That's not the kind of Messiah that I am. The kind of king that he's bringing is, is not one of power. It's not one of the Jewish people being on top. It's actually one of taking up your cross, which is an execution method, which doesn't sound very much like a great marketing tool. But that's the kind of king he's bringing. So that's his secret. So now we flip to Satan's secret because in verse fourteen or verse 15 of chapter 4, we see it. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Jesus says the seed is the word of God. And in essence, you can call that the gospel message. Or we like to say uh, at Newground, the good news. That's what gospel literally means. It means good news. But sometimes gospel gets some, some bad press. We call it good news because it should be good news instead of not so good news or bad news, right? That's what the word of God is, is good news. So Satan here starts snatching it up before it even has a chance to take root. 
because it's in a path where it can't even grow in the first place. That's where the, where the seed is. And the sower is just throwing the, the word of God all over the place. It doesn't, have, not, not, doesn't care about efficiency, okay, for all of us wonderful producers. Like, the, the farmer's just throwing the seed wherever. And three of the four soils aren't the right kind of soil for the seed, but he's still throwing it anyway, which says a lot about Jesus. But what's interesting is that if we look like later on, because Paul likes to, I like to use Paul to talk about Satan a little more because he talks a lot more about him. But in Ephesians chapter 4, like this is two chapters later from what I quoted before, Paul also has another name for Satan. He calls it the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And later on, if you read chapter 4 of Ephesians, and we can read the whole book of Ephesians, but that would be, that'd be a fun series. But chapter 4, um, he's talking a lot about practices that the church should consider if they want to say that they're part of the kingdom of God. There's all sorts of stuff in there. All these practices are major practices of how we're supposed to live. And Satan, then, is working on patterns of living that are contrary to that. For example, uh, in Ephesians 4, we see Paul pleading with the Ephesians for unity amongst their church. This is a prayer that's happening all the time in Scripture. It's something that Jesus prays for in the garden before he's about to be arrested. He prays for unity of all the believers together. And Paul is so emphatic about this in Ephesians chapter 4. He's just talking about ways for the church to be unified. And it's interesting to me because, I mean, as we go throughout the story of Scripture, this is, this is part of Jesus' secret as well. Because one of the things of the kind of kingdom that Jesus was bringing that the disciples didn't expect, that the teachers of law didn't expect, that any of the Jewish people expected, is for it to be more radically inclusive. At the end of the story of the Bible in Revelation chapter 7, do you know who's at the, the grand banqueting table? Do you remember, we went through this series of, couple the last couple summers but in chapter seven do you know who's at the table people from where it says every tribe every tongue and every nation do you think that's more than just the jews yep in fact jesus is constantly emphatic about this table being more than just for the jews the jewish people they are for the jewish people but it's not just for them the Jewish people are supposed to be the starting point of ushering in the rest of humanity. You're God's chosen people, not because you're privileged, not because you're special in the sense of like you did something to earn this. No, I just chose you, but you're the reason I chose you, this is way back in Genesis 12, I chose you so that you could be special and brag about it to everybody. That's what it says in Genesis 12 to Abraham, right? Nope. No, I, I blessed you because you're going to be a blessing to the nations. So I chose you because. And the reason I chose you is because you're going to be a blessing to the nations. You're going to show the world what I'm like. And you're inviting people to that table. That includes people who are not Jewish. And that's what Jesus is constantly emphasizing, which is all over the Hebrew Bible. It's all over the prophets. It's in the Torah. It's everywhere. It's just by this time, they've denied it. And so constantly, Paul is like, constantly praying for unity jesus is praying for unity of the church all the time and not just for the jewish people praying for everyone in fact if you remember paul gets really really angry at the corinth church basically corinth was like the las vegas of the ancient world and in the church in corinth they are having communion together and a lot of people take this you know to mean something completely different usually they usually take this to mean you need to take communion very seriously you know confess all your sins what have you which is a good thing to do by the way you should that's okay to do but that's not what paul was talking about in corinthians what they were doing is they were mimicking the roman culture on how they did table seatings and how they dignified people the rich people had a seat at the table they got there early. The poor people had rails on the outside. They stood out at a distance. They might get food if they're lucky. They're definitely second-class citizens. And the Corinth church, when they came to the communion table, that's what they were doing. The rich were, That's what Paul talks about in Corinthians. He's like, the rich are coming. They're eating all the food. They're drinking everything before people even get there. And the poor are there, and they're like, you know what? You can just have whatever's left over. There might be some crumbs left. 
And then Paul says, yeah, if you take communion together then, you do it in vain. Why? Because you're missing the whole point of this table. The table is actually a symbol for the unity of humanity that Jesus is praying for, that Paul is praying for, for the Ephesians. Because at the communion table, there is no hierarchy. At the communion table, everyone is equal, no matter what your socioeconomic status, no matter what your gender is, no matter what life has brought you, no matter if you're Jewish or Gentile, rich, poor, it doesn't matter. When you're at this table under Jesus, we're all on the same playing field. That was revolutionary in the first century. There's no one, no society that ever did this in history, but the Christians did. And it was causing all sorts of ruckus. And now Paul has got these Corinthians doing the same exact thing as everybody else was doing. There's no, nothing different about this table. And Paul says, if that's what you're doing, yes, you're doing it in vain. Yes, you're drinking the, the contempt of the Lord upon yourself because you're missing the point. So what is Satan's secret? <laughs> like, that's a good segue, right? Here's what Satan's secret is. It's not really a secret, but it's one he wants to keep a secret. Satan wants to cause division in the church. That's his secret. And just saying that already should let you know he's done a pretty good job. Hasn't he? (laughs) I mean, we got division all over the place in the church, right? That is not God's desire. God's desire is the church to be one. And constantly praying for it. It seems like a pipe dream. But the end of the story, it's happening. Whether you are going to be a part of it or not right now, you don't might not see it all, but in the final restoration of all things, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, no matter what label, is going to be at this grand banqueting table. Satan is not going to get his wish. I'm just letting you know. But man, he's going to do everything he can to take down as many people as he can. And I can't tell you, he loves to divide the church more than anything else and will do anything to influence on a macro level how the church divides itself. What does that actually look like? Here's the interesting thing. I've heard this before, which really baffles me. I've heard people say that Satan was really surprised by the cross, by Jesus going to the cross and dying on the cross, that he was shocked, that that was the secret of Jesus. Like he, he, going, him going to the cross and dying for the sin of all creation was like, it, it surprised Satan. Like Satan couldn't find a way to deceive his way around that. That's a bunch of hogwash. Satan knew exactly about the cross. He knew exactly where that was going. He knew exactly what Jesus was trying to do because all he's ever trying to do is stop Jesus from doing that. All he wants to do is stop the church from being modeled after the cross. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, Satan will do anything to make sure that that doesn't happen for the church. And he has done a really good job in succeeding. Because when we talked about what is Jesus' secret, the kind of kingdom that he's bringing, anything that doesn't have to do with falling after the cross is not of the kingdom of God. We talked about that last week. Do you remember, oh, this is later on in this book, we'll, we'll get to this passage in Mark chapter 8, Peter is with Jesus and Jesus tells him, hey, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. That's, he literally gets that specific. I'm going to be murdered which is what happened to every false messiah in the last 150 years. Peter can't believe it. What are you talking about? You're going to die and be killed. You're the messiah. You're the conqueror. I'm thinking of Kang right now, Marvel. Too much Marvel in my mind. You're the conqueror. That's who you are. And you know what the Bible says? This is crazy. Okay, Peter knows Jesus is the messiah. Man, I... He's got some guts, man. I'm telling you, Peter does. He got some guts. 
You know what it says in the scripture he does? Can you imagine this? He takes Jesus aside. Jesus, come here. And he pulls him away from everybody so that, you know, he doesn't embarrass him, Jesus. He doesn't want to embarrass Jesus. And the scripture says that Peter rebukes him. He knows he's the Messiah. He goes, Jesus, come here. Are you an idiot, Jesus? What are you thinking? That's what he does. Now, I don't know what the conversation was. It doesn't say, but I mean, can you imagine the, the guts? The boldness he has? He, I mean, this is, he, he, he believes he's the Messiah wholeheartedly. Of course, he believes the Messiah as a military conqueror. That's why he's rebuking him. Why would you talk about dying? Because that's not supposed to happen. From all the hundreds and hundreds of years the prophets have foretold, that's not what's going to happen to you, Jesus. You are crazy. You know what Jesus says to him? He says, get behind me, Satan. Now, does that mean that Peter was possessed by Satan? No. No, it's Satan's influence on a macro level. Peter's saying, look, Jesus, you're the military conqueror. It's time to go. We've been with you for three years. It's time to kick butt and take names. Let's go. You're talking about dying? You're crazy. Come here, Jesus. We need to tell you who the, what the Messiah is really supposed to do. Jesus, get behind me, Satan, because Satan knows that you have no idea what the way is right now. That's why you're Satan. That's what Satan does. And there's all sorts of division. There is nothing that pleases Satan more than to steer the church away from its true purpose. And it's really hard to say this, that the true purpose is the community that follows after the cross. But that's what it is. That's the secret. And Satan will do anything to know that. So to say that Satan doesn't know about the cross is ridiculous. Of course he does. He knows the power of what's going to happen because it's God. And God can take the worst things in the world and turn them into beauty and gift. And Satan doesn't want to have any part of that. He will do anything to make sure it doesn't happen. Get behind me, Satan. Which is so interesting when we talk about the word spiritual warfare. We've gotten so spoiled by horribly misinformed <laughs> books. The thing, like, it's like angels and demons with like flaming swords. Like, bing, bing, bing. I'm in a little battle fighting each other all the time. That's what spiritual warfare is. It involves violence and, and sword play on a spiritual level. It's like more epic. That's not the spiritual warfare that Paul is actually talking about. If, if you look at the, the final chapter of Ephesians, chapter 6, the entire time, the whole entire letter, do you know what he's been talking about? He's been talking about the way the church practices together. That is the spiritual warfare he's talking about. That is what Satan is trying to divide the church over. In the New Testament, this is your homework. Sorry, I don't give homework. Life learning opportunity. Okay, I don't give homework. You're not getting a grade, all right? It's a life learning opportunity. You should, you can, and so it's so nice. You can actually Google this. It's so, it's so much faster. But go, but it'd be more fun if you do, go through the New Testament and look up all the commands that have the words one another after it. There's a lot of them. All of these commands are all commands of how the church is supposed to practice with one another. And this, if, if the church practices this way, one of the results that will happen is that they will become unified in its purpose. And Paul spends a whole lot of time talking about that. Even in Ephesians alone, he's talking about this all the time because the church is divided, even in the first century. I know it's hard to believe because they're, you know, they're really close to Jesus. They can't be, they can't be arguing yet about stuff. But the church is even divided back then, which is why he's writing all these letters. I mean, think now about all of the things the church has divided over. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, some churches have split over what music you play on a Sunday morning, right? Like, God forbid if we play an organ in church or we don't play an organ in church or we have a drum set in church or guitars or whatever, right? Or... We argue aver over how someone should physically be baptized. Should I dunk them? Should I sprinkle them? Should I pour water? Which, by the way, they did all three in the, in the early church. Most people don't know that, but they did. 
But the people split over this stuff. Do we baptize infants or not? Well, we better split over that. Or how do we view about, what's our view on the afterlife? Church has split over that. You know, churches in the last two years split over whether or not you should wear masks in church. Hmm? They split whether, uh, over whether or not you've got a COVID vaccine. Do you see how Satan is just licking his chops? He is winning when that happens. That's why we try not to concern ourselves with such thing at Newground. Because it's not of the kingdom of God. We're, we're playing into Satan's tools when we get involved in that kind of stuff. And then you have to start asking, well, what, is it, what does it look like to live into being a community that's cross-shaped? In fact, this is how Peter talks about how to resist the devil. In his letter, he actually talks about this. He says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Okay, most people just like take it out of context and just quote the verse. Hey, resist the devil! And you go, you sit there, you go, okay, I won't do this thing, I won't do this thing. Flee from me, flee! That's not what happens, okay? If you look at Peter, what he's doing, right before that, he talks about a practice. You know what the practice, you know what he says right before that? The practice is humility. That's what he says. If you want to resist the devil, you should pursue humility, which is really hard to ask, by the way, if you've ever prayed for that, by the way, I'm just warning you. If you've ever prayed for humility before, God will answer that prayer every time, and usually not to your liking. I told you a story about that with me. I, asked, I, I prayed for God for humility because I saw this in Scripture, and I ended up tearing a disc in my back and like being in bed for like a year and a half and going through 24-7 excruciating pain. I'm not saying God caused those things. I'm not going to get all concerned about causality of those things, but I wasn't surprised at the end, in hindsight, when I was like, you know, I was praying for humility. And humility usually involves things that I can't control, that I want to control. And Peter says, if you want to resist the devil, then you should pursue humility. The opposite of that is what? What's the opposite of humility? Pride, right? What's that mean, pride? It's like, I'm all that. Look at me. You're the center of the universe. Peter says, look, if you are that way, then you're not in the kingdom of God. You're not, you're not practicing what the kingdom of God practices. You are actually a tool for Satan right now. You're giving in to what Satan wants. That's what's dividing people. So you should pray. So it's all practices that the apostles are constantly talking about, that Jesus is talking about. Look up these commands of one another's. And then maybe start asking questions. This is a, man, this will be really hard for us if we, if we have to be really transparent and honest with ourselves. What does this actually look like in our own church community? I'm not saying this stuff isn't happening, but some of this stuff is, there's a lot of commands. There's a lot of them. That'd be a great series to do. It'd take another year and a half to do, but it'd be a great series to do. Because Satan wants to make sure he can do everything he can to make sure those one another commands don't happen. How do we resist this? We practice what Jesus teaches us. That's what a disciple does, by the way. A disciple imitates his master, a true disciple. So Jesus, throughout the Gospel of Mark, is telling you, take up your cross and follow me. That's what you practice. What does that look like? Well, there's a whole myriad of ways that looks like, but it, you know, it's not the way that everyone expects. That's the secret. Think about, we talked about this last week, because of what people expected Jesus? Because the disciples wanted him to, to pursue power. And obviously that's going to bring a tremendous amount of resources and wealth again. It's also going to bring, a, he's already got a lot of celebrity. He's already famous for all the stuff he's doing. But they like, hey, you need to be famous. We need to get the word out. And Jesus just like pushes away all of that, saying that is not even close to what I'm about. And so what's interesting, if we really get honest uh, with ourselves, I'm saying collectively as a church, right? We're talking about macro level. Any movement, whether it's church or not, that pursues power, 
that pursues wealth for its own sake and pursues celebrity is not of the kingdom of God. How many things in our churches are motivated by those three things? You don't have to answer that out loud. But I know you're thinking stuff, right? Because we know it happens all over the place. I've talked about some of those stories here, about the pressures of, of those three things. But if that is the motivation behind whatever is happening, Jesus doesn't want to have anything to do with it, and Satan wants to have everything to do with it. And if, if, if a church community is influenced by these three things as their motivation, I would argue they're under the power of Satan. I don't say that lightly. It's not something to be proud of, obviously. But that's how Satan works. And it divides the church. People get so focused on their pet things. You know, here's, here's, a, here's a phrase of power. This is my church. This is our church. You know, that's a statement of power. Is it really your church? Is it really our church? Really? No, it's God's church. We're not the center of attention. He is. I know it sounds like semantics, but that plays out in all sorts of situations. When opportunities come your way for the good news to be lived out, and you're so focused on, well, you know, they put a dent in the wall. Well, they spilled something on the carpet, so maybe we need to reconsider, because this is our church. I'm not saying that we do that, because if you look at our floor, you can understand quickly, we don't really care about that. <laughs> but I've been in churches that have been part of this, right? And that's, I know it seems trivial, but you could take that to all sorts of levels. It happens all over the place. So here's your homework. I'm going to give you a hint. I'm just going to give you a few one another commands, just as a teaser. I don't give homework. I give life learning opportunities, okay? Don't. You're not getting graded. I have to tell the youth this all the time. This is our homework. Oh, my mommy. No, that's not your homework. Holy scriptures. Come on, people. But listen, these are, these are very, a very small snippet of the one another commands. Be devoted to one another. Honor others above yourselves. Build up one another. Forgive one another. Be patient with one another. Show hospitality to one another. Have there been moments where you haven't been able to do some of those things with people in the church community? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we're trying to enable what they're doing. I'm not saying that at all. There's, there's complexity to a lot of these things. However, these are commands, friends. These are commands of what's expected of the church community who represent Jesus, who represent the kind of kingdom that Jesus is bringing and has brought. Anything that doesn't have the, if you think of the opposite of this, whatever that is, that's what Satan does. Does that make sense? I know it sounds simplistic in some ways, but it, I mean, that's what, Satan wants nothing but the opposite of these things to happen. And I'll just give you a little snippet. There's a lot, the list is much bigger. And there's a lot of other things in it. There's rebuking and admonishing in there. There's like, you know, having the hard conversations with someone who's really like, messing up their life and others. We're supposed to do that for each other as well. With graciousness, there's specifics for that in there with one another. But there's a whole list of things. Obviously, there's love. That's in there a lot. Probably because we just need to hear it over and over because we keep, like, screwing it up. I'm just scratching the surface. If we want the church to be unified, we've got to live in accordance with Jesus' secret and not Satan's. This is what we're trying to do here at Newgram. I'll, I'll show you how. We, you've probably heard this a million times, but think of it in the light of what we just talked about today. I'm going to put our vision and mission on the screen. I'm going to read this to you. Our vision. Now, vision is what we want to see. Right? This is like what gets us up in the morning, like the kind of desire of our hearts, if you will, of a church. We, we see an authentic community inviting our neighbors to gather around the table in the transforming grace and truth of Jesus Christ. It's not something that we necessarily advertise to the world, per se, because this is like our pulse. And all of this is very intentional. If we walk through every one of these words, that's a whole other. We, we did a, I did a, like a one-shot teaching, which is a very broad stroke on this, like early in the summer. 
But all of those have intention. You kind of notice and compare that to what we just talked about, Jesus' secret and Satan's secret. We'll keep going and keep that in mind. The mission you do know. You should know by now if you've been here long enough because we say it all the time. We should. It should be really easy to remember. If you want to know what we're about, people are like, hey, what's New Ground about? Living the good news of Jesus seven days a week. You've heard that a million times probably. I'm exaggerating. I'm using hyperbole, but it's probably pretty close. I mean, at least it feels like that to me, which is always good. We should. Living the good news of Jesus seven days a week. Someday I'll have that in nice lettering sitting right there in between the screens, but we're good in there. Living the good news of Jesus seven days a week. And that has intention. Every one of those words have intention. Those phrases have intention behind them in accordance with the kingdom of God and what Jesus is trying to do. Next slide. We have values. Values is how we embody the vision and mission. What does it look like when we do this? It looks like authentic community, which, again, all of these, uh, we did separate teachings on all this stuff, right, in the last few months. Authentic community. We know authenticity is not just about come as you are. It's also like a willingness to change. That's what authenticity is. Curious together. That's really important. Like, people have doubts about God. They're on the fence. They have questions. Good. You should. It's okay. In fact, they're welcome here. I still have index cards sitting back in that shelf. If you want to ask questions about anything that you heard, put it in the, put it on the card and drop it in the box, and I'll try to respond to it because we're curious together. Because Jesus said he's the truth. So if someone's pursuing the truth, that's what they're looking for usually. Well, in the end, it's Jesus, so I'm not, why would we be threatened by that? Why would a church be threatened by that? They should, they should welcome that. They should welcome questions, the hard questions. They should not have all the answers. They should be curious about people's situations instead of like just constantly being angry at them all the time for whatever judgments they want to make. Go on, curious together. We're prayer filled. We've talked about that. It's a posture, not just like saying words. It's a posture of listening as well. Prayer filled, scripture focused. We've talked about that. The scripture is important. We also have to understand that we have a set of lenses that we come with to the scripture. And we're trying to unpack more and more how many sets of lenses. You have many, by the way. You, all of us have many lenses that we wear. Some of them we're not even aware of that we come to the Bible with that can really screw us up, that Satan has used to divide us, which he tries to do that with Jesus in the wilderness before he goes out in public ministry, by the way. He quotes a bunch of scripture to him and twists it. Generous hospitality. You kind of notice some of those things that, that might be in conjunction with the, some of the one another commands I I showed you earlier, or what we talked about with Jesus and Satan's secret. I mean, they're kind of like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. And then we have a strategy, which we'll, we'll land here. Table to table. We, we talk about it a lot. I kind of wrote it out. By the way, the stuff that I've, I've, I've written out, all the stuff you're seeing, is this, we put this on the top of every agenda in our consistory meeting and walk through it every single month to remind ourselves who we are and how we're lined up with this. So table to table, there's a, there's a little Im- infographic. Let me show the infographic real quick, Matt. So you do, yep, so that's a little infographic uh, that we put up there for it. So you see the communion table central. We're taking communion day, how appropriate, all right? All right, go back. So we invite others to the table. It's, it's a strategy, that's the strategy, table to table. It's how we do relationships. How do we actually embody this these values in the mission and vision. What does it look like? It looks like table to table. We invite others to the table, fostering deep, intentional, mutual relationships. It's centered in the communion table, which we talk about Jesus. That's where Jesus' secret is, right? What he's doing at this table, we're going to talk about in a second. And we extend this table to our relationships with those outside the church community, which is the community table, to those in the church community, which is the banquet table, and in the most vulnerable spaces, Usually our homes, but that's the dinner table, wherever that dinner table may be. It's our most vulnerable spaces where all the walls are taken down. That's how we do things at Newground in everything that we do. That's how we embody the values. That's how we do the mission. That's how we have to try to see the vision. It's this, and it centers on this table, which and contains Jesus' secret. I mean, can you imagine the disciples like, what are you talking about? I mean, Peter probably should have rebuked Jesus in this moment. Because he said, hey, this is my body. It's broken for you. Every time you eat of this, you do this in remembrance of me. You're like, what? What is he talking about? Well, they found out later. 
By the way, he's doing this in the Passover, which I can't, I can't wait to talk about when we get to that time in April. All right? This is during the Passover that he's doing this. All right? He breaks his, he said, this is my body broken for you. And then he takes the, there's four cups. This is the third cup, the cup of the new covenant, which actually isn't new, new. It's like in Jeremiah, but he's, he's talking about it. He's kind of inserting himself into it. This is the blood of the new covenant for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And every time you drink of this, you do this in remembrance of me. So at the communion table, the secret is Jesus has broken himself open and poured himself out, which sounds a lot like that, doesn't it? That's what he's doing here. That's what he's doing at this cross. He's breaking himself open and pouring himself out. Why? (laughs) Well, for the forgiveness and the restoration of all creation and the reconciliation of all things. So it's a declaration of what he's doing. And it's an invitation. I've heard that word before somewhere. It's an invitation to his disciples to embody this whole vision. Not only is this a declaration of who God is, I'm also calling you, church, to be a person that, what? Takes up his cross and follows him, right? I break myself open and pour myself out. That doesn't sound very like, exciting, by the way. I don't know about you. <laughs> like, yay, I'm ready to break myself open and pour myself out and suffer. Yay. Right, that doesn't sound like a really good marketing tool, right? But that's what he's calling us to do. That's the invitation. And yet, we know how many times, if you've been in church long enough and practicing this, that amazingly beautiful things happen when we invite ourselves to be broken open and pour, off, pour ourselves out for the sake of the good news. Living the good news seven days a week. A lot of times it's really hard. Sometimes it, like makes your anxiety meter go up to the 15th level. And you're like, "Ah, I don't know if I can do this. This is totally not me. Ah." And yet, this is what the call is. And then beautiful things start to happen. That's why Jesus, like, look, this is why I want you to remember this all the time. Why? Because we forget. We forget that Satan wants to do anything he can to divide the church. And this table is the ultimate (laughs) place of unity where everyone comes here on the same playing field. No matter what label we put on ourselves, no matter what label others put on yourselves, you come to this table and, and you're in union with Jesus and what he wants, what he desires and who he is, that's when you come to this table. And when you eat of this and drink of this, you are signing up for that. And if you don't, if that's not what you're signing up for, if you're not practicing this, I mean, this is where Paul's like, look, you're just drinking contempt upon yourselves. It's not, it's not like a guilt-shame thing to like, beat yourself up, because we all fall short, by the way. But it's, this, it's the vision of who God is declaring us to be and who he wants us to become at the same time, the already, not yet, at the table. It's, it's a picture, right? We talked about it's a picture of being right there with the disciples, just like in the real moment of Jesus with this invitation. And so when we come, that's why it means so much to people. It's just bread. (laughs) It's just juice. And yet it's not, right? You're entering into something sacred that's declaring Jesus' secret. And everybody else that doesn't follow this thinks you're going to be nuts. You're crazy. It doesn't work that way. Wait, you're not going for power or wealth or status? What's wrong with you? That's the whole purpose of living. That's how you get raises in your job. That's how you get noticed at school. Why would you go the opposite way? Because that's Jesus' way. That's a secret. And in that, there is an overabundance of life. It's, I know it's odd. It doesn't make any sense. This is what he invites us. That's what happens when you come to the table. And we don't care about what your story has been in the past, whether you're worthy or not. That, that's not a question here. If you want to say, look, I'm going to sign up for this. I know what I'm signing up for. I mean, you do it with fear and trepidation in some ways because like, wow, this is a bold call. But we're all invited to do this. We're not scanning you to make sure you're worthy. That's what, that's what Satan does to divide the church, by the way. 
who's welcome and who's not welcome. Mm, I think Jesus has a lot to say about that in the Gospel of Mark so far, doesn't he? <laughs> he kind of just like throws it all out the window for a lot of the people. You mean we're going to do that with this table? Ah, come on. No, that's why for here, if you want to pursue this, Jesus is looking here. It's open to all of you who want to come because there's something transformative about this space. That's why it's a center of all our relationships. What happens when those relationships transfer to those outside our church and inside our church and in our most vulnerable spaces if we have this kind of practice? Revolutionary things happen. Let's pray. God, I pray in these brief moments, whatever it is in our hearts that we're thinking of, of ways that we are influenced by Satan's masterwork of influencing practices of life that are destructive to us, God, I pray right now that you would shatter those walls. Lord, that we'd we be open to you shattering the, the hard walls of our heart that we'd like to build. Lord, sometimes to avoid the hard conversation. Lord, sometimes to avoid the uncertainty. But God, I pray that those walls will be shattered as we come to this table and remember that no matter what we think of ourselves, no matter what others have judged us as, you come saying, this is how I respond. I break myself open and pour myself out for you. And God, I pray as we come to this table that we not only make this a declaration for our lives, but we make this an invitation to how to live seven days a week. And Lord, I pray for a massive transformation in hearts in all the relationships that we have. Lord, that people would see the way we live and, and say we're crazy. And yet, God, see that there is such a life in it because it's of you. We're so grateful for who you are, for how you continue to pursue us, how you break yourself uh, open and pour yourself out for us. May we reflect the same. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, 